Good morning, friends. Pastor Justin here with Hartzell United Methodist Church. We're glad that you're joining us for worship again today as we continue our Everyday Missionary Series. Let us start with a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be entering into your presence today. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would speak, that you would give us ears to hear, a heart that is willing to respond. We ask this all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Our reading for today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 1 through 20. Let us hear the words of the Lord. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, Peace to this house. If a person of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet we wipe off against you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles that were performed in you would have been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? No, you will go down to the depths. He who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me. But he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is the word of God that is spoken for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'd like to start today with an exercise of imagination. So if you'll close your eyes for just a minute and imagine that you are a TV sportscaster. You're standing on the sidelines of maybe one of the biggest football games of the year. Maybe it's the Super Bowl. Maybe one of the college bowl games that we just finished watching. Maybe just a really big high school football game. And the team nearest to you is standing there together and their heads are all bowed. They're, they're kind of getting ready to go out on the field when suddenly they give that, that great cheer and the coach trots out onto the field. All by himself. The, all the other players just kind of go and they, they sit down on the sidelines, on the bench. And, and, and this is really unusual, right? And, and so we, we do what we nor, most people would do in that situation. We take the microphone up to them and we stick it in the face of one of the players and then we say, what in the world's going on? And he says, well, the coach is going to play for us today. All by himself, we ask. He says, sure, why not? I mean, he's got a lot more experience than we do. He has more training than we any of us. And, and, and so bewildered, we kind of watch the game unfold. Right? The, the opposing king kicks off the ball. 
and the coach catches it and he starts to run up the field but immediately he's he's met by this whole wall of opposition completely buried by the opposing team he hikes the ball again and again but he can't make any progress because he's trying to do all of the work all by himself and when he's on defense, well, there's no way he can defend all 11 players out there on the field. And so they score, and they score, and they score, and, and he ends up losing by a landslide. You know, that story may sound a little bit crazy, but isn't that the picture that we tend to have of the church? That we tend to sit on the sidelines while we allow the professionals to do the ministry of the church. Uh, after all, they're the ones with the training. They're the ones with the experience. They're the ones with the schooling. They're the ones who are even paid to do it. But listen to God's game plan. Listen to what Paul says for, to us in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 12. He says this, Jesus Christ has given the church apostles and prophets, evangelists and pastors and teachers. Why? To prepare the people for works of ministry. To prepare the people for works of service. You see, my role and by God's design as your pastor isn't to do everything there is to do in the life of the church. It's not to do all of the ministry. My role is to empower you and to equip you and inspire you and train you to get out there and get in the game. My role is to motivate you in such a way that you go out and execute the plays on the field of life right where you live, work, and play. We're called to get in the game. We're called to, to be actively involved in the mission of Jesus Christ in this world. He charges us to be his playmakers and game changers in this world. Right where we live, right where we work, right where we play. And so last week we began this series called Everyday Missionary, where I challenged you to begin to see yourselves as missionaries, right where you live, work, and play. My goal in this series is to inspire you to step into that God-given call, that call that he's placed on your life to be that missionary right in the place you find yourself at every single moment of this day. And so last week we explored the final call of Jesus Christ, that last will and testament where he called his disciples together and told them to go and make disciples of all nations. And we saw that we were authorized for this mission. We saw that we were called to this mission. We saw that we were gifted by God for this mission and that he has promised to go with us every single step of the way as we go out into our world. Today, I want to center in on the why or why it is that we must go into the world and make disciples of Jesus Christ. And so take a look at our passage from Luke chapter 10. I want to set the scene for you a little bit. Uh, from the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, he had called his 12 disciples together, and he called them to follow him and to be involved in his mission. Right there to go out and to fish for people. And so for the first few chapters, he, they mostly follow him. Right there observing what he, he does. They're watching what, he, what he's saying. You know, they're listening to all everything. And then in chapter 9, he finally sends the 12 out. He sends them out two by two to do the exact same things that he's been doing for the last eight chapters of his ministry. They go out and they heal the sick and they cast out demons and they preach the message of the kingdom of God. And now one chapter later, he calls 72 other disciples together to go out and do the very same things that the 12 did back in chapter 9. In fact, the language that's used here is almost identical to what we find just one chapter earlier with the 12. And that suggests that this is a regular pattern for Jesus' ministry. Right? He sends everyone out, everyone that calls themselves a disciple, everyone who follows them. He calls them all out. It's not limited to just a select few. It's not limited to the 12. It's not limited to the pastors. It's not limited to the professionals. He sends everybody out on this mission in the world. None of us are excluded. And he, and he sends us out, I think, for at least three reasons that I want us to center in on today. The first is this. He sends us out because our ministry is desperately needed in this world. It's desperately needed. I mean, just notice where he starts here. He starts by telling us that the harvest is plentiful, 
but the workers are few. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And the last half of that sentence, the, the workers are few, presents a very serious problem, right? Something that needs to be resolved. I mean, just think about a harvest for a minute. When, when, when a harvest is ripe and it's ready to come in from the field, there, there's a very limited amount of time in which you can go out and, and do the harvesting. Right? If, if you wait too long, the harvest is going to go bad. And so for, what do farmers do around the harvest? They, they go out in their fields. They work long, very extended hours to, to ensure that everything can get in from the field. And that was also the case back then. But they didn't have all of the nice machinery that we have today. They didn't have the, far, the tractors and the combines and all that kind of stuff that could speed this process up. And so what the farmer would do is they would go out into the marketplace at harvest time and they would hire extra people to go out into their fields so they could guarantee that they could get everything in from the field and the time that it needed to be. Now Jesus is applying that same image to the church. Right? He tells us that, that the harvest is plentiful, that there are people who are hungry for Jesus Christ who are longing and, and craving the good news that Jesus has to offer. The, the harvest is ripe and ready for the picking, but, but the problem is the workers are few. There is simply not enough people to get the job done in the time that there is to do it. The work is far greater than the number of people. Our ministry is desperately needed. It's needed because without us, people who are hungry for the good news of Jesus Christ will never have the chance to know him. It'll be too late and the season of the harvest will pass and maybe some of them would even die without coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Our ministry is desperately needed. In fact, as of one 2014 survey, 23% of the U.S. population said that they claim absolutely no religious belief of any kind. 23%. And that's not just no Christian belief. That's, that's no religious belief of any kind whatsoever. And that means that at least one in four people that you meet every single day, no matter where you are, whether you're at work or at school or at the mall or, or, or out driving your car, one in four people that you meet and encounter are in desperate need of the good news of Jesus Christ. One in four. That, that's a very large number of people that you are encountering every single day that needs your ministry that are in desperate need of your ministry. And so what's Jesus do here? He urges us to pray, to pray. Now, and I don't know about you, but when I generally think about praying in this context, I always think about praying for the harvest, right? I ask God, make the harvest plentiful. I ask God, make, you know, uh, you know, make people come to faith in Jesus Christ in mass. I started to pray this way. It, it, but it shocked me as I was reading this that that's not what Jesus prays for. He, he doesn't pray for the harvest because the harvest is already plentiful. What he prays for is workers, more workers. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Right? He, he prays for us. He prays for you. He prays for me. He, he prays that there would be more people who would be willing to go. More people who would be willing to respond to the call of Jesus Christ. More people who would be willing to take a leap of faith and, and to step into the very places that they find themselves with the good news of Jesus Christ. Our ministry is desperately needed. And so here, here's the question that the one it really comes down to is, do you really believe that your witness is needed? That it's desperately needed by the people around you? Because if you don't think that, that 
what you have is needed, you're never going to take the leap of faith. Jesus says your ministry is needed. Your ministry is critical because the size of the amount of the work depends on it. That it can't be finished without you. It's needed. Secondly, he sends us out because the mission is critically urgent. It's critically urgent right now. I mean, notice how he starts here. He, he calls these 72 together and he sends them out two by two to, to go ahead of him to every town and place where he's about to go. I mean, that, that's kind of the image of the herald that we talked about last week. I mean, that, that official emissary that would be sent out on behalf of the king. And so the herald would be sent out and, and, and they would go ahead of the king and they would you know, clear out the road. They would make sure there weren't any thieves there. They would make sure that that was safe and they fill in all the potholes and all those kinds of things and, and announce the coming of the king. And that would typically, what would happen is the king would follow just a couple days behind, which meant that his arrival was near. It was close. I mean, notice the message in verse 9 and again in verse 11, the kingdom of God is near. It's near. Jesus is coming. Some translations say the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, it's this language of radical closeness. It's almost here. I mean, the Greek means it's so close that you can taste it. It's, it's knocking at the door. It's so close that in this moment, the future is already breaking in to the present moment. It's urgent right now because this is the moment. It, it, it's, it, there's not much time left. And so what's he saying in verse 4? Don't take a purse. Don't take a bag. Don't take sandals. Do, don't greet anybody else on the way. I mean, it almost sounds a little insensitive of Jesus to, to tell us not to greet people, but but I think here's the point. He says this because the mission is too urgent. It's too urgent. that There isn't enough time to go home and pack our bags. There isn't enough time to, to make sure we got an extra pair of shoes. There's not enough time to, to simply shoot the breeze and, and, and to deal with insignificant things. But the mission is critically urgent. In fact, back in chapter 9, this guy comes to him, and he's, he's wanting to follow Jesus. And Jesus says, follow me. And he says, well, first let me go back and, and bury my dad. And Jesus says, no, right? because the mission is too urgent. It, it, you can't wait a year for, for this burial process to take place. And, and the next guy comes along, and, and Jesus, he wants to go say goodbye to his family. And Jesus says, no, why? Because the mission is urgent. Time is short. It's critical. There, there's no time that we can waste. I mean, you might think of it like a horse with blinders on. Right? The idea is it's so urgent that we cannot deviate our current course, that this should be our, our entire Focus. We can't turn to the left. We can't turn to the right. We have to be singularly and entirely focused on this one mission because people all around us are dying without Jesus Christ. It's urgent. I mean, Paul goes so far in Romans to say, let's not let any debt remain outstanding except the debt to love because he doesn't want us to get bogged down in all of the, these things of this world where it's going to begin to occupy our time and our attention. He says again in Romans chapter 7, or 1 Corinthians 7, not to marry. Why? Because time is short. We're going to be bound up in so many other things. He wants us to have a singular and solitary focus so that our time isn't divided between 50 different things. So that we have the time and attention to devote to the task and the mission that is critically urgent at this moment. I mean, the, I'm reminded of this story. It comes out of the life of uh, the missionary Hudson Taylor. And one day he was uh, traveling on a Chinese ship and he was sharing his faith with this guy. He could tell the guy was under some conviction, but he was still rejecting the message. And, and as they were in the midst of this conversation, the guy got knocked off the ship. 
and he fell into the sea and no one moved to do anything about it. So immediately Hudson started to take action. He, he sprang to the mast. He let the sail down. He jumped overboard in hopes that he could save his friend. He's tried to call people to come and help. He, he saw a fishing boat that was in the distance and he beckoned for them to come and help look for his friend, but no one would move. They were all caught up in, in fishing and so he had to give them every single penny he had in order just to get them to come and help. And they cast out their nets and they found him, but by then it was too late. He had died and drowned because they were so busy caring about their job, their work. And I, I wonder how many of us are so busy with the things of this life that we've stacked up our plates so full that we don't have time for the mission that God Jesus has charged us to. You see, there's some things that maybe we need to let go of in 2022 in order to devote ourselves to the singular and solitary mission of reaching people for Jesus Christ in this world. The mission's urgent. It's urgent. And I think a lot of times we don't live with that sense of urgency that Jesus calls us to because we have our plates so full or because we think we have all the time in the world or maybe even because we start to think that, well, most people are good and they're going to go to heaven anyway. I don't know how many people I've talked to and who talk about how they don't even, even know one other person who isn't a believer in Jesus Christ. Even the one in four people claim no religious belief of any kind. See, Jesus prays for more workers right now, at this moment, because it's urgent. The harvest has to come in right now. It can't wait till tomorrow. It can't wait till next week. It can't wait till next year. It's urgent. It's urgent. Because he understands that without him, there is no life. Without him, there is no salvation. He is the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. So the question I want to ask is, are you really living with the kind of urgency that Jesus is talking about here? Do you really believe that if you don't share your faith, that just maybe that other person won't be with you in heaven? Are you living with that singular, solitary focus that is focused entirely on the mission and the call of Jesus Christ? Or is your time divided by all these other things that we've deemed to be so important? You know, I wonder what you would do differently if you knew that your friends and your loved ones would all die tomorrow. How would that change your priorities? The mission's urgent because we never know how much time is left. And then finally, he sends us out because the potential is great. The potential is great. I mean, just think about that image of the plentiful harvest again. It's not just a harvest, it's a plentiful harvest, an abundant harvest, a harvest that goes above and beyond what we would expect. It's ripe for the picking. And that means there's, there's potential, great, great potential when we go out into the world to share our faith, it's not simply a nice pipe dream. There's a great possibility of leading people to Christ. And I look at the end of this passage, the 72, they get back, they, they return with joy, and, and they start to tell about all the things that have happened. They talk about how the demons submitted to them. and it, It's almost like they're surprised. They're surprised by what happened. They're, they're shocked by it. But Jesus doesn't seem surprised at all. It's almost like he expected it. Because I think here's the lesson. He, he sends us out into a harvest that's ripe for the picking. He sends us out expecting that we'll succeed. He, he doesn't send us out 
to fail. He sends us out with his authority and with his power. He, he sends us out to advance on enemy territory and take back ground. And even though our enemy may be strong and powerful and mighty, it's nothing in comparison to the power and the authority of the God who goes with us. And that means we have the advantage. And if we have the advantage, then the potential is true great and i don't know about you but that really changes things for me because when i go in expecting failure i don't want to do it but when i go in expecting success expecting a great harvest expecting potential you know i'm so i get excited about that i get enthused by it. i i want to get on board because i know that god's going to do something phenomenal through me that that i can't even fathom the potential's great but let, let me make one just one small caveat here but just because the potential is great doesn't mean the work's going to be easy right harvest in a field by hand is not easy work my guess is he, there's not enough workers because it's hard it's difficult I mean, he says he's sending us out as lambs among wolves, and that's not the most pleasant picture. Right? Lambs are peace-loving, wolves are ferocious. And that tells me there may be some times that rejection does happen. And in those moments, he tells us what to do. He says, shake off the dust of your feet, move on. Remember, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. You know, I think sometimes we take it so personally. And we don't step out because we're afraid that we're going to be rejected. But Jesus wants us to remember he sends us out to succeed, to succeed. And even if we are rejected, it's not us that they're rejecting. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. And the 72 get back. They, they return with joy and they start to report and all the, the good things that happened. But they, they don't talk about how many times they had to shake off the dust of their feet. But I think that's because God wants us to center in on what went well. And the good stories. The stories of success. Because the potential is great. The harvest is ripe. It's ready for the picking. And the question is, will we respond to the call? Will we step out and so I want to challenge you to get in the game this week. I want to challenge you to talk to one more person about your faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe that's simply to offer to pray for them. Maybe just to invite them to come and join you on this broadcast. You know, send it out via Facebook to all your friends and mention what you learned from it today. Or maybe it's just to be a presence in someone's life and to let them know the good news of Jesus Christ. Whatever that may be for you, I, I want to challenge you to get in the game because your ministry is desperately needed. The mission is urgent right now and the potential is incredibly great. Let us pray. Jesus, we come to you right now and we say yes to your call. We choose to step out and be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in this world, to be your messengers, your heralds, to bring good news. And so we ask, Lord Jesus, that we would cling to these truths as we go, that we would remember how much we are needed that we would remember how urgent this mission really is. And that we would remember that the harvest is ripe for the picking. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. May God bless you and keep you, and may he use you mightily this week as you share your faith with those around you. We'll see you again next week. God bless.